Well, let's get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Tony Monaco, the president of Tufts, and I want to welcome our students, staff, alumni, and friends to this semester's final Tisch College Distinguished Speaker Series event. Tonight's program will be a special forum on women in politics, featuring three distinguished politicians who have served at all levels of government. Congresswoman Catherine Clark, State Representative Keiko Oral, and Boston City Councilwoman Ayanna Presley. Launched last fall with United States Senator Elizabeth Warren, Tisch College's Distinguished Speaker Series brings public leaders to campus from a range of fields and perspectives to discuss pressing problems plaguing our society today and how civic engagement and public service are critical to solving them. In its first year, this D Distinguished Speaker Series hosted former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, former Senator and Tufts alumnus Scott Brown, political journalist Matt Bai, film director Oliver Stone, and many others. Tisch College continues this impressive legacy with tonight's honored guests. This evening's lecture will be conducted like many of the other events in a fireside chat style interview. Joining us as our moderator for tonight will be Boston Globe columnist Yvonne Abraham, who will get the insight and perspective of our featured guests on leadership, public service, and government. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kay Kawashima Ginsberg, the director of Tisch College's Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, or CIRCLE. CIRCLE is one of the nation's leading sources of nonpartisan research on the civic and political engagement of young people in the United States, especially of those who are marginalized or disadvantaged in political life. As a former lead researcher, deputy director, and now as director of CIRCLE, Kay has played an integral part in leading CIRCLE scholarly research that informs policy and practice for a stronger democracy. She has a PhD in clinical psychology from Loyola University, Chicago, and she brings her expertise in positive youth development and community psychology to her work at CIRCLE. As part of this work, she is one of the nation's leading experts on the civic and political development of women and girls. She has author authored influential reports like Taking the Lead, How Educators Can Help Close the Gender Leadership Gap, and in 2003, she presented at the White House Conference on Girls' Leadership and Civic Education. Earlier this year, with another Tisch College colleague, she co-wrote Run Like a Girl for Office, How Higher Education Can Advance Gender e Equity in Politics for the journal Diversity and Democracy. Tufts is incredibly proud of the leading work being done by Kay, Circle, and Tisch College in this field, and we are pleased to have her offer welcoming remarks for tonight's events. Please join me in welcoming the director of Circle, Kay Kawashima Ginsburg. Kay? Thank you, President Monaco, and many thanks to our panelists and moderator for joining us tonight. As President Monaco mentioned so kindly, I'm the director of Tisch College's Circle, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. We focus on political life of young people in this country, and we care deeply about those who are marginalized and left behind. And we use research to connect to the practice and practice the research. And we're honored to be here today. Tonight, we gather to discuss the opportunities and challenges that women face in politics today. And looking at the data and research, it's pretty easy to focus on challenges. Despite some notable and very high profile victories in recent years, overall, women's representation at various levels of elected office has stalled at around 20% since 1990s. And it really hasn't changed appreciably since then. Massachusetts is no exception. According to the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers, Massachusetts ranks 21st in the nation in terms of the level of female representation in national and state elected offices. So why is this? The research confirms what's been felt anecdotally for a long time, which is that women who aspire to elected office continue to face formidable obstacles. Some have even likened the experience to walking through while men are often encouraged and wooed into politics and receive support and success, women tend to come when no one told her to and are motivated by issues they care about in the communities they represent. 
and support can be really hard to come by. There are a few indicators in the research about why this might be, and I know we all look forward to hearing from our panel about their own experiences. For example, research indicates that once women decide to run, mentorship and instrumental fundraising support are harder to establish for aspiring female politicians than for males. Even today, women politicians often have to answer questions about who is taking care of their children while they attend evening events like this. And they persistently confront the pressure to do it all. And the signals girls receive start very young. Tisch College's original research in collaboration with National Education Association and American Association of University Women found that even the most egalitarian teachers inadvertently exert subtle biases that would impact girls' belief about their ability to lead. Namely, given the exact same candidate statement for a senior class president race, teachers described a girl candidate named Emily as inexperienced and not authoritative enough, while the boy candidate with the same statement named Jacob was more likely to be viewed as assertive and aggressive. These subtle gender biases are likely to continue into adolescence and to college years. Data also suggests that women enter college feeling far less confident about their ability to lead. And that gender gap actually expands by college graduation instead of shrinking. But all hope is not lost. And tonight, we have evidence of the successes that women have at all levels of elected office. We are honored to have these leaders with us tonight and to inspire us with their experience hard work and insights to examine the issues they're working on and to discuss what the future holds. Let me briefly introduce them. United States Congresswoman Kathleen Clark represents the 24 cities and towns of the 5th District of Massachusetts, including right here in Medford. First elected to Congress in a special election in December of 2013, Congresswoman Clark has had a distinguished career in public service including as a state senator, state representative, general counsel for the Massachusetts Office of Child Care Services, and policy chief for the state attorney general. Impressive. Throughout her career, Congresswoman Clark has been a champion of policies that help children and families. In the House Democratic Caucus, she serves as a senior whip and is a member of the steering and policy committee. And much related to tonight's discussion, an article in the Boston Globe this week called her a go-to person for national Democrats to help recruit candidates across the country to run for Congress. Thank you for being here. Councilwoman Ayanna Presley's career has been marked by a relentless determination to advance a political agenda focused on women and girls and breaking cycles of poverty and violence. She was first elected to the Boston City Council on November 3rd, 2009 becoming the first woman of color ever elected to the council. Just last week, she topped the ticket in the at-large Boston City Council race for the third straight election. The councilwoman created and chairs the Committee on Healthy Women, Families, and Communities, which is devoted to stabilizing families and communities, reducing and preventing violence and trauma, combating poverty, and addressing issues that disproportionately affect women and girls. In 2015, Councilor Presley earned Emily's List's Rising Star Award and was named one of Boston Magazine's power players. Representative Keiko Oro is the first Asian American woman to be elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives. She was first elected in a special election in 2011 and re-elected in 2012 and 2014. Representative Oral is a forceful advocate for the financial needs of the communities and school districts she represents. She has worked on educational issues related to standardized testing and the common core standards, has promoted a regional approach to job creation along Massachusetts' South Coast, advocates for the small business sector, and is working to increase international opportunities for Massachusetts companies through exports to Asian countries. Our moderator this evening is Yvonne Abraham, 
a renowned columnist for the Boston Globe Metro section, Yvonne's work appears on Thursdays and Sundays. She previously covered state and national politics as well as immigration issues at the Globe. Yvonne came to the paper in 1998 from the Boston Phoenix. As I turn things over to Yvonne, I thank you all for being here. We look forward to an enlightening conversation. Thank you so much. excited about the day when we no longer need panels on uh, women in politics. All right, so I'm going to start off. Uh, this is as much from me as for everybody else, but um, what is the most ridiculous thing anybody has said to you about being a woman in politics? And I'm going to have all of you answer this. <laughs> the most clueless question or the most gobsmacking comment or... Who wants to start? Oh, I'll start. Great. Because I, 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 have, I have a good one. Um, so I can't remember how it, uh, what the beginning of the conversation was, but this was a um, Democratic member of Congress. And we were talking about a topic of the day. And um, I, I do spend a lot of my focus is on policy around women, and women and economic justice for women, early um, education and care. And we were talking, I believe, about uh, recruiting women candidates. And there was a lot of discussion about uh, that. And this member of Congress said to me, you know what you all forget is that we gave you the right to vote. <laughs> that was 2015, your US Congress. Wow. That, that one I won't forget soon. That's spectacular. You can, you can top that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of Oh, sure. One of the, um, one of the unique features of, of me is that I have an unusual name. So my name is Keiko Oral. And a lot of times people can't tell if I'm male or female uh, based on my, on my name alone. And so, um, at, on one occasion, well, it's actually happened more than once, um, people will introduce themselves and they've said, oh, and your name, they mispronounce it, and then they say, how long have you been in the country? Your English, <laughs> your English is very, you speak English really well. And so, as a native-born um, American citizen, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's just an, an unusual, ridiculous type of question, so. You, you do speak English. I do. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure I can top that, uh, either of those. Um, I'll tell you a pet peeve of mine, um, especially when I do media uh, appearances. People will often, uh, in online comments, or uh, they will uh, tweet or direct message me uh, to ask why I don't smile more. And that really grates my nerves as if when I'm having a conversation about human trafficking uh, or some great injustice or poverty um, that I should have a smile plastered on my face. You know, I, so I, that is one of my pet peeves. We've all been there. <laughs> um, so um, as Kay was saying, it is um, quite difficult for women compared to men to see themselves as leaders, as uh, you know, uh, pot political potential, um, and, I, and so I'm really interested in how you all decided finally to run for office. Um, we, we've read the studies that show that women have to be asked multiple times to run for office, whereas men are more, uh, more inclined to think of themselves as presidential uh, from birth. So um, <laughs> I would love, and, and after this I'll go to um, more specific questions for each of you, but I'd love to hear from all of you again on this one. Um, tell us about that first decision to run for office. Um, and we'll start with the council. Well, I was, um, my mic feels very loud. Is this loud for everyone? Okay, okay, all right. Um, so before I was uh, recruited to run for office, which is a, a common narrative for uh, many, female candidates and elected officials. I worked behind the scenes in government for some 16 years, uh, for uh, Congressman Joseph P. Kennedy II for four years, for Senator John Kerry uh, for 11 years. And um, 
I was one of the people actually who recruited me to run is a dear friend, Jesse Murmel, uh, and is in the audience this evening. Um, but, but people approached me and said, you know, we're looking at uh, people from MassVote, Avi Green, I see Cheryl Crawford's here from MassVote as well, and said, we're looking at the voting trends. Uh, there are going to be two vacancies on the at-large, uh, two at-large vacancies on the Boston City Council, and we think you should run. This is the year uh, for a black woman to be elected. And I said, absolutely not. I was my own worst cliche. I had spent uh, 10 years of my life while working for uh, the congressman uh, and the senator, respectively, working to diversify the political pipeline. I had been in the position to recruit women to run. Um, but uh, you know, I said, as is the case for many women, I, I can't. My mother's battling um, uh, cancer. Uh, I'm not married. Uh, there's no one else to pay my mortgage. Um, I had very legitimate reasons. but. Uh, the largest reason was fear, and that I didn't feel that I was uh, qualified, uh, which is ludicrous, you know, and this is the case for many women. So uh, let me just say this, that before we talk about um, strengthening that opportunity for women to run and to run and win, and how do we inform that aspiration for women when they're girls, uh, everything has to do with dismantling these, these cultural norms that get in the way. I think uh, women uh, ask permission to lead, I think women don't operate with the same sense of entitlement. Um, that is why you could see an 18-year-old white male uh, that would have the gumption to challenge a sitting incumbent, um, and a 32-year-old educated woman who's raised three children will say, I haven't done enough, I don't know enough, and I'm not qualified. Uh, the final uh, scenario that I'll, that I'll share with you is um, as someone representing the entire city of Boston when I visit our Boston public schools. I will tell the students that I represent an entire city, and I will ask them, can you venture to guess how many people live in the city? And the boys will very quickly shoot their arms in the air and say, a trillion, two billion, four million. <laughs> and the girls will sit on their hands, and they won't say anything because they're afraid to be wrong. Uh, so the challenges for getting more women to run um, really does begin when those women are girls. Uh, and informing that aspiration and giving them that sense of entitlement and uh, to feel emboldened enough to stand in their power and to not apologize for it and to not ask permission to lead. Ultimately, I said yes to running because I saw it as an extension and a furthering of really what had been a lifetime of service for me. And I wanted to specifically work on those issues that disproportionately impacted women and girls. And that perspective was not being represented on the municipal level. There was certainly a crystallized moment, but I can think of more of those moments uh, where I was talking myself out of it. And I do want to say, when you're growing up, your parents will say to you, be mindful of the company you keep. Uh, that's not only about um, guilt by association and making smarter choices. Uh, be mindful of the company you keep so that when you forget who you are, you are surrounded by people who will remind you and see something in you that you didn't see in, in yourself. Um, I found great reward and challenge in being the person behind the person. And ultimately, again, I said yes, because although I had worked with people for whom I had an alignment of values and who I held in very high regard, this was an opportunity for me to actualize my values and to articulate and amplify my own voice. And that was frightening. This is a very tribal, parochial city. This is an adopted home for me. I had been an aide for 16 years, and I uh, knew very well how to espouse and pontificate the views of the people I worked for, but no one knew how I felt about anything. So uh, it was, that was a challenge, but it was also incredibly uh, liberating. So my husband and I are both very active in our community. I live in the community of Lakeville. We, we were just active in, um, in, our, in local politics. And so when the position opened with the prior representative moving into the private sector, it was really a family discussion because he could have run, I could have run. Um, and it really there really wasn't a question once we got in if we were going to we were how we were going to proceed as far as me being a woman and I don't even know that I even considered that um, I am I saw the position as an opportunity to advocate for my district and to advocate for the people around me in Boston and solving problems and so 
I didn't know really what I was doing. I didn't have, um, I didn't come from a political family. I wasn't the pick of my party. I had a lot of things um, moving against me. And so, but I'm very competitive. I like to win and I work really hard. And so in getting the message out to the voters, I think that's what that came across that the advocacy piece of this position that I was going to be a very strong, tenacious fighter on Beacon Hill. And so uh, why, in the end, uh, how did you come to the, the decision that you would run and not your husband? So I was working um, in a part-time position and my husband was in a full-time position and so he had um, more of, it was more of a risk for him to, to run and perhaps lose. Um, and I was free to, to give it my all, and so it was actually more of a risk-based type of decision. Um, I, I never thought I would run for political office. I was very happy as a public interest um, attorney, uh, but we moved out to the suburbs to Melrose from Boston, and there was a school committee race, and I was working in early education and care in my day job and watching sort of policies and what was going on and um, this school committee race there were eight people running and there were nine open seats so I thought that was a great race uh, <laughs> to get involved in. I uh, didn't need much polling or analysis um, and I think I'm not sure I ever would have gotten into politics if it hadn't been that easy and sort of that guaranteed of success. Um, but. Um, uh, once I got going and I had been working in state government for a while, interacting with the legislature, uh, there was that moment of sort of, you know, there aren't very many women on these panels when I go to testify. There aren't many, very many uh, women chairmen when I'm in front of Ways and Means asking for the budget for my agency. You know, we're, you know we need different perspectives. Um, to really make our commonwealth and our representation strong. So when the seat opened up for state representative, I really jumped at that chance to, to be part of that and to hopefully boost the 20% the that we seem really stuck at, both at a state level and nationally. And you defended from the House to the Senate, from the Senate obviously to Washington, and do you, did you dispel all of that other Oh, Did no. you have similar kind of hurdles at every stage? No, there have definitely been hurdles at every stage. And I think that um, uh, one thing we were, we were talking about earlier with some of the students and that Ayana referenced, I think that women put so much on themselves as far as pre-qualifying themselves out of positions. And um, I have been very fortunate to have uh, incredible positions open up when I really didn't think they would, um, and to have a supportive team around me that said, take the risk. And um, I, it's one thing that I've learned and that I would say is that um, uh, taking the risk is where you have the greatest learning. Um, we, I didn't win every race I won. I ran for state senate in 2004 and, and lost that race. Um, but uh, like a lot of candidates say, but it's absolutely true, I learned so much from that. And I learned that there's life after losing a race. And it was a friend of mine who is very involved in electing women to office, uh, Barbara Lee from Cambridge, called me about two days after I lost when I was feeling blue and down. And she said, so what's next? What's the next step? What are, you, what, are you, what are you doing next? And it was really that call that made me think, oh. And she's like, this isn't over. This is part of a, a learning curve. And what do you, what's your next move? And she just didn't stop calling until I came up with my next plan. And, uh, um, and I think it's that kind of encouragement. Like you were talking about, who do you surround yourself with who can really help women? Because uh, most women do have to be asked many times. Um, and I think it's helpful to flex that political muscle and run yourself and ask other women 
to run as well and make sure that, that you keep asking uh, because sometimes it's something you never would see in yourself as doing, but it's incredibly rewarding work. And I think that we're a stronger democracy when we have a Congress and a state legislature and a city council that reflects who we are and what, who we are as communities. And we bring different perspectives, and that's important if we're going to come to consensus around policy and legislation. We need that input. And uh, it's really, that's the, the, the power of these jobs and the power of running. Yeah, well, uh, we had, um, and my mom is here with me, and uh, we were very much a matriarch family, matriarchal family. Uh, my grandmother was at the top, and we had dinner, Sunday dinner at her house every, every week. And we had wild political conversations. Uh, we had my dad, the Republican, and my grandmother, the Democrat, and they would lob over, and everybody else would sort of get involved in the whole mix. Um, uh, my grandmother won. <laughs> but we, uh, we let my dad think once in a while. When she really wanted to get to him, she would say, you look so much like Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and then, <laughs> wow, this enraged uh, uh, guy. But uh, 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 just an uh, um, interesting story on that one. After all this and all these years, and they really loved each other, um, at 80, my dad went down and registered as a Democrat. And uh, it was a pretty amazing transformation. But one of the few things I'm very grateful to George W. Bush for. So um, <laughs> I've totally gotten off your question. No, I have no idea no, you how, how I got here. Oh, sort of middle school. Um, uh, so it was funny, because when I was in the restroom earlier, there's a sign on the stall. Uh, stalled door and it says middle school lol write about it and I'm like oh middle school I still I have a middle schooler at home and I'm still amazed that any of us escaped that but seventh grade was such a demarcation in my life where I decided it was so uncool to be smart um, there was just I saw who was getting asked out and um, and I just was like I, I do not want to be the smart girl anymore and the idea, I was also absolutely terrified of speaking in public. Um, my, I could feel my ankles actually hit each other. I would be shaking so much. So the idea that I would ever be able to stand up in front of the Congress of the United States and speak and talk about issues just so far from what I envisioned for myself. But um, we've been lucky to have role models. And, and people who did reach out, and people who said, I will give you money for your campaign. I think you should do this. I gave the most compelling argument to my friend why I would never run for Congress. And two months later, um, I did. But that was partly because he came to me and said, you should. And then each argument I put up, he said, no, 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 that's not right. You should do it. And. Um, it makes a difference to have that kind of support. And I think that we tend to limit ourselves. And uh, Ella Grasso, you know, maybe that was, it was all about the governor of Connecticut when I was growing up. Maybe somewhere back in there, there was like, women can do this too. So, um, there are studies looking at college students that have found that men's mm -hmm. perception of their leadership skills start higher than Sure. So I uh, went to, I attended Smith College, and uh, entering college, I did not see myself as a leader. I was just grateful to, to be attending and um, was very focused on trying to survive. And my friend, um, who is, is uh, she, was, she was active in, in 
politics and, and the student government. And she said to me one day, um, why don't you run for class president? And I did do the, I did do a double take as far as, well, I don't even, I, I don't even know how to do that. And so um, as part of asking women to run, um, I think it's important to show them how to run. And so my friend not only asked me to run for class president, she showed me how to run. And so I was successful in becoming the junior class president at Smith, and, and it, was, it was a great leadership experience. I got to sit on the board of trustees, and um, being, being given that opportunity really it gave me a sense of empowerment that, wow, I, I really can do this. And, and I had been involved in a smaller scale in some different clubs, but not really um, being able to reach out to a broader population. But with that one position, it became clear to me that I had something to offer. Who okay. Right. So I think I'm a hybrid of both their experiences. So um, when I was growing up in, sh in Chicago for a number of years, my school, uh, Francis W. Parker, did not offer uh, written grades. They would just send home pages of comments. And the comment that uh, repeatedly came up um, uh, in my evaluations is that Ayana struggles to use an inside voice. And <laughs> that is still true, which is why I was asking about the mic. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I didn't struggle with finding a voice or expressing it and having a quite amplified one. Uh, I also, uh, Rand Warren was elected uh, to class president, student government president from seventh grade to twelfth grade. I don't know if it's that there was anything uh, exceptional about me. Uh, perhaps I was eloquent, but I might have just been the loudest person. Um, but no matter, um, I was repeatedly elected. And then uh, when I uh, left Chicago to attend Boston University, I pursued every leadership opportunity uh, that one could be appointed or elected to. And I do just want to say this to the, to the young women in the room here. Um, I think intention matters. And although the seeds of political aspiration were planted for me very early, um, I think it's important that you crystallize what is your purpose before you are obsessing about the position. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the intention and authenticity and what motivates you to do that is more important. And so I think um, in this testing culture and in this uh, obsession about trajectory and ascension, that we have placed this incredible pressure and, and our young people are focused on diversifying their resume and what experience they need to have as a talking point. You know, I want you to be committed to building yourself up so you can build your community up. And so please do the internal work necessary, do those, those moral audits of yourself uh, to really crystallize um, what is your purpose. And for me, I found that early in life and so I was able to simply follow that purpose, and that purpose um, then led me to positions. But don't begin with obsessing about the position and how to get there. It can be liberating to decide what you want to change before you decide what you want to be, in a way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, absol absolutely. I mean, I always say that. I'm just, I'm just following the work. And uh, the other thing I would say that happened for me in college, uh, you know, unfortunately, like one in four women, I'm a survivor of sexual assault. And um, you know, at the same time, my mother was, was battling a, an illness that ultimately took her life, and life got in the way, so I had to leave school. Uh, and I realized uh, not too long thereafter that my life circumstance of being raised by a single mom, a father that battled addiction, was incarcerated, surviving um, abuse, uh, and then rape uh, as a college freshman, that these things were my uh, reality um, and my truth, but they didn't belong only to me. And I wanted to be a voice for those who had experienced similar uh, challenges and traumas. We find so, uh, so many fewer women of color entering politics and becoming active in politics than even white women. And so um, and I think you've begun to answer this question, but why do you think that is? Is it because there are, is it a matter of like a, 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 a double resistance, or is it a matter of life experience, or what, what in your experience accounts for that gap? Well, let me just say that it wasn't until I ran for office in Boston and was dealing with a lot of um, racial and gender stereotyping, marginalization of my agenda, uh, 
you know, people asking, is Boston really ready for a black woman city councilor? Will traditional voters, codified language for, will white people vote for her? Um, that I, I knew that there had never been a woman of color elected to the council, and that was uh, in, in sort of the recesses of my mind, not the four. I wasn't running to make history, but I was aware if I ran and won that I would be. But I'm originally from Chicago, and I had grown up with a female mayor in Jane Byrne. I had grown up with a black mayor in Harold Washington. I had grown up with a United States Senator in Carol Mosley Braun. So I never felt that that was not attainable. Uh, those role models were very accessible to me, and certainly my mother being the most formidable uh, influence in my life given her uh, civic engagement and, and, and activism. I would argue that one of the main reasons women of color uh, don't run, other than just seeing role models and that aspiration being informed, is, that, is wealth inequality. So, you know, disproportionately you have more women of color that are, uh, speaking of matriarchal, you know, single female-headed households. And there are real challenges about, you know, if they're raising children, that is a fair question. Who will take care of them? How will I afford a child care? Women are disproportionately the caregivers and, and caretakers of, of aging uh, parents and, and loved ones. So there are real life barriers. So the cycle just repeats. We have less policies that reflect the diverse needs of women, um, but we have fewer women that can run because of uh, those challenges. So once you decide to run for office, is, it, is there a certain way um, people expect a woman to run for office? Are there more pitfalls or um, hazards, I guess, if you're a woman running for office? Congresswoman? Sure. Um, I, I, think, I think that there are. I think uh, we don't look like the picture of what people think of when they think of a city councilor from Boston or a congressman or a state representative from Lakeville. Lakeville. Um, it's just not, it's not in people's pictures still. And it's what Ayana's talking about is that importance of role modeling and having that mirror image back. I know that for me, I was the, um, the queen of running not for class president, I was running for vice chancellor of moot court and vice president and never really wanted to be the one who stepped out. Like, well, we'll do the supportive role, but we'll actually organize everything. But I didn't want to, and it was issues that made me say, I can speak for this. It was issues and passions around social justice and economic justice that, that gave me a voice and say, no, I, I do want to be that person who is leading. But it wasn't my natural place. And I think that the trouble with campaigns is there's still a great deal of emphasis on appearance. Um, I still, to this day, I remember my dad holding signs for me uh, in one of my campaigns. And uh, two different women came up to him and said, she should be home with those babies. And you know, and that's, and there's still um, guilt about that, you know. And actually, my mom said to me at one of one of the races I was in, she said, "It's your life too. Don't forget, you know." And being that role model, being a, a mom that my boys hopefully will appreciate and, and look up to, even though it's led to some crazy. Um, some crazy times in our family. Most recently, I had a um, experience. My son was looking for something. I said, it's in the dining room. And this puzzled look came on his face. And he said, what room is that? And I'm like, it's the campaign room. And, uh, and uh, he's like, oh, oh, all right. You know, I'm like, that's a, it's a traditional room where families gather and have meals. We just don't do that. but. Um, and, so it's, it's a nice room, it's unused. But um, I think campaigns are, are hard. I think there have been, a, there are a lot of expectations about what we look like, what we should be wearing, uh, where we should be, instead of being in a city council, state house, or in Congress. And if you're photographed in an outfit, um, you have to put that outfit away. I mean, it seems like you have to rotate it. You, you, can't, you can't keep bringing out the same outfit, the same suit that men can bring out, change the tie. Uh, women are held to different standards as far as their clothing. Their hair is picked apart, their smile. 
Um, and I think that that is definitely different for than, than men. And, and I think it's something that it's just, it's, it's just the reality. And so for me campaigning, I, I adapt. I have a huge, it gives me more shopping opportunities. Um, and so uh, I, have, you know, I have a huge closet full of, of, of outfits. I, I think that it's important to, um, to communicate who you are on a campaign. And um, it's really, um, it's, it's, different, it's different for women. Um, because men are just, you just assume that they're going to be strong, and um, I, I think that's, that's what the stereotype is. And so we're overcoming stereotypes as, as women. I'd like to pick up on that. Uh, I've seen a, a lot of campaign literature lately for first-time candidates, uh, female candidates, and they use the word qualified a lot. A man would never do that. Right. Why do you need to make that a slogan? that you're qualified and competent. Men don't do that. They're, oper they're valorized, they're operating from a place that they're always that. Um, you know, I would also argue um, something that really burns me is that when women do run and we win, that we are dismissed as outliers, as anomalies, or in this recent city council election where uh, four women were elected, that this speaks to uh, a trend. Every time women are elected, people say, it's the year of the woman. It's the year of the woman every year, as far as I'm concerned. You know, I, I'm not a, you know, we're not a trend. We're here and we're here to stay. And this, and, and, and this isn't some sorority takeover. You know, I mean, that is ridiculous. You know, and the, the closest example I could give to that that really grates my nerve, and I'll just use Serena Williams as a black woman because this is something that I've struggled with now having run four times and three times been the top vote getter. First woman in 30 years to do that. First person of color to ever do that. And you know, with Serena Williams, when she's successful, people will talk so much about her power, but they won't talk about her strategy. You know, and her savvy and her smarts. You know, this some in all politics, some of it is about luck. But why is it when you know slates of men are elected, people don't say it's the year of the man? I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, we are running and we are winning because we are damn good, because we are smart, and we busted our asses. That's why we won. So. There's no one live tweeting, so I feel comfortable. Except for maybe Jesse back there. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think that's interesting. Uh, well. I think we're done here after that. <laughs> <laughs> to try and fill the rest of our time. Um, yeah. <laughs> there is, um, I, I remember when I ran for Congress, one of my male opponents made the comment like, uh, it was the year of the woman, there was nothing I could do. Like, you didn't run a better campaign and knock on more doors That's and right. contact people and have a real strategy. It was like, oh, well. You know, I, it was, so it gets you either way. You're either incompetent and you're not the picture they have of a congressperson, or you won because somehow women have it easier. And I think, well, in the council race as well, and another thing people were saying was that people just want to change. Mm -hmm. They just want to, and so as if anybody different would be elected, which was clearly not true. Yeah. Right, it's just amazing. And so, uh, speaking of women running for office, let's turn to national politics for a minute. Um, you, uh, we have both Hillary Clinton and Carly Fiorina running uh, for president, and I am really uh, curious about how you think they're doing. Um, they both seem to be walking very, to my eye, very fine lines in terms of uh, arguing that the fact that they're women is a strength, but also making sure to hit that qualified thing. So, um, uh, Representative Ora, I'm wondering if you can just uh, talk a little bit about how you view how Hillary, for example, is doing um, in terms of kind of threading that needle. Um, so I don't know that um, Hillary Clinton is spreading the needle well. I think that um, as a Republican, I feel that her discussion of the um, emails and, and Benghazi, I, I think she did try to address that. But I, I don't know that that has been fully, um, fully 
vetted. I, I don't think that that issue is done, and so I think that that will continue to be something that the population, maybe not here in Massachusetts, but across the country, it's still a big, a big issue. And so um, I think that as far as, as her demeanor within the debate, she comes across very strongly and very, um, very authoritatively and confidently. And so those, I think, are, are positive things. But um, ultimately, I think that we're going to see a presidential candidate who is of a new generation and a new um, vision for the, for the country. So uh, as far as her prevailing to, be, to the presidency, I don't know that that is where I would see her headed. So one thing Kali Fiorina has said is that she, Hillary Clinton, is, um, is, is uh, she's accused of, of trying to be, get elected on the, you know, largely on the basis that she's a woman. And I'm wondering if, uh, Congresswoman, you can take that up. And, and how do you see that? Um, because to, to my eye, it is a very, you can't say vote for me because I'm a woman, but it seems like the second you say being a woman gives me strength, you get accused of, you know, wanting people right. to vote for you purely on the basis of your gender. Well, I, I, um, I am a huge Hillary supporter, and I think she is balancing that well. I think she is, um, talk about qualifications. I mean, two-term U.S. Senator, Secretary of State, First Lady, I mean, she is so prepared and qualified for this job, but I also think there is excitement uh, about having a first woman president. And so I think those two things are very real and part of her campaign. And I think she is trying to balance them. And I think the, there is real sexism that is on display in the coverage of both campaigns. Uh, we did not hear a lot about Carly Fiorina's substantive answers, but we hear a lot about her hair her makeup, the way she's standing, she is not smiling. Um, and you know, we have actually come to her defense when Donald Trump talked about her face and her looks and who would vote for a woman who looked like that, you know. Um, and I think that's important to do for other women, especially across party lines, because it is much more, um, uh, it's taken more seriously if I come to a Republican woman's defense and Republican women come to my defense, um, when there is that sort of blatant sexism. Okay. And I can disagree, and I do, with practically all of her policy positions that I know of, but there's the way she is covered is not fair. And that is the same with Hillary Clinton. You know, uh, Chris Christie can go on a show and do some dancing, and we all think it's great, and it's, he's being spontaneous. All the descriptions of Hillary Clinton dancing on Ellen DeGeneres was, she's stiff, she's unfriendly. I mean, she's dancing on national television. I mean, it, 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 but it's like, that's the focus. And there'll be a piece of substance, and then something about the way she's presenting herself, whether it's wearing too many pantsuits or, you know, the color of her hair. And, you know, it's just um, very different coverage for women candidates. And I remember when Hillary Clinton ran in 2008, they were selling Hillary Clinton nutcrackers in airports. I mean, it's really unbelievable. And, uh, we have to be vigilant, I think, as women in office of all women candidates and make sure we can disagree about the issues, but our, our hairstyle, our uh, shape of our bodies, our, you know, should not be what, what the main topic is. And you just don't see men covered in that same way. Does anything change if a woman is elected president in this country? Does anything change for women in politics? I think um, it's that aspirational role model. It's just that possibility uh, that women can be in any position of power and authority in the United States, including president. And I think it's a game changer 
for anybody of any party uh, to see a women rise into the White House. I think it will have a profound impact. And I think talk about being able to have that mirror back to young girls and young women about anything is possible. Um, that's a very, very um, important and potent piece of having a woman president. Absolutely. I have a, a seven-year-old stepdaughter. And I was showing her a picture of myself and Michelle Obama at an event, and she asked me, when did I meet the president? And uh, I didn't even correct her. So I think it, I think it, but it, but it does speak to uh, this reality uh, for that generation that it's in some ways inconsequential. I mean, it will uh, inform their aspiration. It, it will it will strengthen them in many ways. But it's it's in she will in her lifetime, uh, I believe, see a woman president and has seen an African American president. So uh, we're going to wrap up this portion. Um, with, with one last question, which is, what needs to happen so that we, maybe name, name one thing that you would like to see happen to make it so that we no longer need panels like this? I mean, not the only thing, just one thing that would help. So I have a story in, um, in April, the YMCA uh, sponsored a, an event at the State House where students from all over the Commonwealth participated in a youth and government event. And I had the privilege, it was a two-day event, and they took up roles um, as senators and representatives, as, as state officers, and so uh, we were swearing in the new governor. The new governor happened to be uh, a girl from Middleborough. And so I was there, and I was able to swear her in as the new governor of, of the YMCA youth, youth legislature. And I was um, flanked by the Asian Speaker of the House. And as I stood on the rostrum and I looked out into the audience, I couldn't tell the one black person. I couldn't tell the three women. I couldn't tell because the audience was so diverse. And I think that when I stand on the rostrum today, I don't see that. And I think that that's not reflective of the Commonwealth. I think that that's where I think we need to be moving. And so. Uh, for those of you who are considering political office, I say, run. You need go ahead and, and try. Uh, I think you can't be it. It's like you need to see it to be it, and, and you see it. OK. Well, I think it's important that we are not only uh, informing aspiration and building a pipeline uh, by default of our just being in the positions, but that we have to lift as we climb. Uh, that's why this last campaign, I created a position a fellow specifically to diversify the pipeline, I think uh, there is a focus only on who's going to be in front of the podium and on the microphone. But again, having been an aide for 16 years, uh, there is great reward and challenge and influence in being the person behind the person. And, it, and I think particularly for women candidates, when people are questioning your viability, uh, it would be great to have a community of women that could rally around you that know how to cut turf how to write a winning field strategy, how to write policy, how to write uh, communications messaging. So we can't just make this about running for office. This has to be about the, ex the experience in its totality in the entire continuum in order for us to really get to a place of, of gender and racial parity. And then the final thing I would say is that we have to be unapologetic in naming that. You know, We will not have a vigilance in achieving representative racial and gender parity unless we continue to name that and to work at that and to fight for that and to argue that with that cognitive diversity, that diversity of perspective and opinion and thought, that all of government is strengthened by that. And without that, the issues that we work on will be monolithic and homogenized and our approach to how we govern will also be one dimensional. I think, um the one thing I would just say is support someone who's running. Support someone who reflects your values. You know, if you have the means to write a check, that's great. If you don't, knock on the doors, uh, make the calls, but get involved. This democracy is only as strong as our involvement. And, you know, the elected official is just sort of the top of this huge pyramid of people who share values but you have to help them. And you have to ask them to run. 
you have to recruit them, and then, you know, you have to make sure that you're there and doing the work because it's so critical uh, to where we're going. Uh, and I think, you know, we all have to work for campaign finance reform. I think, you know, I was saying earlier, there's sort of all the issues that I work on and that I'm passionate about. If we're not addressing campaign finance reform and climate change, we're not going to have anything else to, uh, we're not going to have a democracy no and we're not going to have a planet. Um, so we have to, you know, elect people at all levels of government. And it matters because once you start running, um, it becomes habit forming. And, you know, it's like, it's like exercising any muscle. Once you start using it, you're like, oh, it gets stronger. And I can see the ways. And so it matters. These local races are important and the turnout is terrible and it matters that when people flipping through and see the local cable that they see people on their school boards and on their board of selectmen and their city council that reflect back uh, who they are so uh, you know the one thing I would hope is just increase civic engagement and uh, if you want to be the candidate that is great and uh, uh, but support those people who are running so even though we've sold everything, we're going to change. <laughs> Does anybody in the audience have any questions? Yes. Stand up. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak about uh, the marginalization that women face in politics. And I want to ask a question about another deeply politically marginalized community, which is the transgender community. As you may be aware, President Monaco sent a letter to the governor a couple of months ago urging swift passage of the transgender public accommodations bill, which I know you have covered in your column. And I know that you have um, uh, explicitly endorsed at the state level. And members of Oral, my question for you is, I know that in 2011 you voted against the Transgender Equal Rights Bill. And I was wondering if you have changed position um, on the current legislation before the Joint Committee the Judiciary, or if you can continue to oppose the rights protection for trans people in Massachusetts. Thank you for the question. Um, so I, I haven't seen the legislation that will be um, proposed. I don't, I don't know if it's been amended or changed, so I can't speak to the specific legislation. I can speak to the fact that I don't want people discriminated against, and I think that as far as the, um, as far as my understanding, I feel like the policies that are in place are are able to be protected for trans trans people. So um, that's where. I had a long conversation with a colleague um, from Cambridge, and we, we came to different sides of the issue, um, where I was trying to explain you know, why I, I was thinking the way I was thinking as far as that specific piece of legislation. And, but I think what's, what's so important with that issue is that we show respect on both sides. And so we may come to a difference of opinion, but um, in the end, the majority um, will prevail. And so with that vote, yes, I did vote against it, but the majority prevailed and it did pass. And so was that, uh, that was, I was contacted by many people in my community that that was the position that, that I took. So um, as far as what I've learned in this position, it's that respect is most important, especially on controversial issues and pe things that people don't really want to talk about or disagree with. And, and we, we had a discussion earlier where we had some pointed questions um, regarding abortion earlier. And, and I took an, an opposition. I, I'm, I'm not in agreement with my two colleagues. And, and yet what happens is then you have to decide, well, is she a piece of garbage or am I just going to try to keep working? And I think we have to try to say, yes, she has that opinion, but we have to keep working. And so um, I don't know how I will be voting on the, on the well, actually, I've, given what I know, I will probably be opposing it because I feel that the laws are, are, are str strong enough as they are. Um, but then, so then if we disagree, it's like you have the decision of, am I going to work with you on another issue? And for my colleague in Cambridge, we decided to disagree and we're working on other issues. And she doesn't hate me. I don't hate her. We wish we could. She wishes I could come to her opinion. I wish she. Could, I wish she could come to mine. But we're going to keep working here because we're just 
people on this planet for a short bit of time, and I believe we need to show each other kindness. Um, well, as I was saying, uh, with the two uh, in the in the the powerful inner sanctum that is the ladies' restroom, uh, <laughs> where all the important debates and, and conversations occur, um, that I do think it's important that we operate with respected conviction, but without being self-righteous. And uh, that's true on both sides, and that's challenging. And that ultimately, in terms of reaching consensus and finding things that we can work on, I think a lot of times you are putting the work before the relationship. And it's just, it's an old but true adage that in order to do good business, you must first be in good relationship. And so there's a lot of work to be done in, in that regard. I do love that there are disparate opinions up here because it proves what uh, I'm always saying, which is that women are not a monolith. And so we should be celebrating this diversity of viewpoints. And so the last thing I would like to say about that is to the electorate, please celebrate and embrace a diversity of narratives of women running for office. One of the things that I found most offensive in running the first time in 2009 as a single unmarried woman without children is the number of women that would challenge the notion that I would fight for the Boston public school system or uh, to stabilize their families because I didn't have one. I mean, you know, that is um, ludicrous and offensive and we have got to embrace a diversity of narratives for our female candidates. Uh, you know, be it openly gay, uh, you know, uh, same-sex, uh, you know, parents, black women with dreadlocks, you know, what, what, you know just the diversity of, of visual and, and identification, I think that's really, that's really critical. Otherwise, we'll continue to limit uh, the voices of women and the diversity of their experiences if we just continue to double down on one narrative, which is that, and I will tell you that ultimately since people ask me throughout the campaign, um, if you're married, I would say no. They would ask me if I was gay. Uh, they would ask me if I had children, and I would say no. Uh, why don't I? And so finally I said, listen, here is the deal. I am married to my job, and you can be my baby. It worked out. I have since then got married. I didn't need to say it. <laughs> to an actual person. something just um, about the transgender issue because I think it does talk about um, looking at things in the long term you know we cannot just look at any change that is happening from election cycle to election cycle and that's sort of where we get focused we get very focused on the horse race the you know the the, the primary um, and something this important to me component for a very small percentage of the general population that has um, so much violence, so much discrimination, but it's going to be a long, you know, we have to keep working. We passed the first bill in Massachusetts, but it didn't have the public accommodation piece. So now we have to keep coming back and we have to talk to people. Um, I can't remember the exact headline that was in the New York Times after uh, the Houston ballot question went down. Um, but I think it said hate triumphs, something like that. And that really wasn't how I saw it. I think it's fear triumphed, and we have to keep working to explain what, what transgender is, um, you know, why, uh, why this is not something to be afraid of. But I think a lot of it goes also to our economic underpinnings, and that when people are feeling economically insecure, they look for groups, um, they look for ways to section off, and they feel that cultural changes um, and civil rights um, expansion and expanding the definition of who is a woman, who can use a woman's bathroom, um, are very fearful things for people. So we have to be um, strident and vocal, and, um, but we also have to keep a long-term game in mind and that things won't stay the same. Um, I've always been surprised at how quickly marriage equality came once it got going. And that isn't to say that 
civil rights came quickly to the LGBTQ community or that we are all done uh, with that. Um, but we have to keep, keep moving and educating and realize that much of this comes from fear-based. And we have, to, we have to meet that, frankly, with a love-based policy uh, that is inclusive of everyone. Okay, so you women tend to be really competitive among each other, and I would like to understand how, when it comes to the political work field, does this competition prevail, or is it more of a co cooperative environment? due to the fact that there are so many, so little women, and women want to like, um, engage each other in the politics. Oh. So I'm at the State House, we, are, um, we have the Women's Caucus, we do band together, and uh, I think that we do have issues that we coalesce around, and we are, we're working on together. Um, I don't see as much of the competition once we're in the House, um, it's mostly beating the people that are running against us. And, um, and I think that it is a spirit of cooperation. And what I've seen in, in, this, in the state house is, is that I look to mentors to uh, show me, and have, I've been in for four years, to show me how things uh, work. And so my mentors, one is a Democrat, Pat Patricia Haddad. She's a speaker pro tempore, and um, she, I share a community with her of Taunton. And then the other is uh, Representative Betty Poirier from, from Attleboro. She's a Republican. And so those have been my role models within the House. It's working cooperatively. Well, as I said earlier that um, on the Boston City Council, people would have you think that there's been a sorority takeover. Uh, but there, you know, there hasn't been. Uh, we're all uh, you know, candidates and incumbents who ran a smart, hard uh, campaigns and we're successful. And so if this isn't a sorority takeover, that means that we're not gonna function as if we are a sorority. We're not a monolith. Uh, the number one, despite our winning sports teams in the city of Boston, the number one contact sport remains here, politics. Uh, and so of course it is going to be uh, competitive. Um, the, we share gender and in some instances we share uh, shared values. And, and maybe a vision for the city and this commonwealth. But what I do see happening is, is the media feeding this idea of competition or catfighting when you are just colleagues who disagree and who have a strong point of view and are vigorously expressing that. So um, I think it isn't fair to infer that when women are serving in government, that it's going to be a sorority and this sisterhood. It's like any other colleague, try to find those areas of, of common interest and that you can work on, that you can work on together. And uh, the last thing I would say is that the other thing that feeds and supports a culture of unhealthy competition is when women are, when there are few women. You know, there needs to be a greater community of women and then there'll be less of that uh, competition when it's just you and one other. So I'm looking forward to seeing what sort of dynamics and, and what, uh, what that will mean for the council in, in this year. That's probably a good point to leave it on. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of Tisch College and Tufts University, I want to thank our panel, our moderator. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about um, role models, uh, and certainly you represent some of the finest role models in public service in government and politics that we're able to bring here to campus, and we very much appreciate your being that, uh, but also joining us this evening. President Monaco said this was the last Distinguished Speaker series of this semester. Um, we will begin again in, this, in the next semester. I know many students are already thinking about uh, exams and what have you. Uh, but we will be hosting David Gregory, um, David Axelrod, and, um, and Beth Myers. Uh, we'll be doing a forum in the spring about the presidential campaign and others, so stay tuned. 
And we have a little something we want everybody who joins us as a guest to go over a little something to remember Top Spy and to remember Tish Spy. And so there's a little bag, a brown and blue bag next to you. Um, and for those of you who might find something with elephants on them, that's not a partisan statement. <laughs> It's just our, with all due respect to the representative, it's our mascot. So thank you all for joining us.